Atlassian is a company that provides collaboration products to software companies. Two guys dropped out of university to start the business in their bedrooms. In the 12 years since then, Atlassian has generated $1.6 billion in export sales. The company sells to 130 countries and employs more than 1,000 people. Scott Farquhar is the co-founder and co-CEO. Last year, he and Mike Cannon-Brooks were listed on BRW's rich list as billionaires, both aged 34. Scott Farquhar argues that Australia is years behind even developing nations when it comes to fostering the tech industry here. I caught up with him earlier. Scott Farquhar, welcome to Late Line. Thanks for having me. How many people do you employ in Australia versus overseas? We employ about 700 people here in Sydney and about 1,000 people around the world. But as I understand it, Atlassian is one of the biggest users of 457 visas? Yeah, that's correct. About 25% uh, of our staff in Sydney are here on a 457 visa. And why aren't those 25% being recruited locally? Oh, we'd love to recruit them locally. Um, we, um, you know, we do a lot for the local industry here. We have about 75 grads coming in next year to Atlassian, but we just can't find the senior talent that we need in Australia, and so we recruit them from all around the world to come uh, work in Sydney. When you say senior, what sort of jobs? Um, developers, product managers, designers, um, people in the technology industry with five and ten years experience. They just don't have them, we don't have them in, in Sydney in uh, the numbers that we need. Um, mostly we get people from Silicon Valley, from Europe, um, around the world and bring them to Sydney. Why don't they exist here? Uh, the, Industry, technology industry in Australia, when we started 10 years ago, it, it didn't exist. Um, there was no technology industry and uh, we sort of built it over, over that period of time. And so I'm hoping in 10 years time it will exist and that we won't need to import these people. Um, but for the moment, they're just, it's just too nascent here. Is it because we've been short-sighted in policy up to now? Um, I wouldn't say policy is the entire uh, area. There's been a few things that have hurt us, like employee share option schemes and other things that have hurt the domestic uh, technology industry. But... By and large, it's a, um, a, a sort of a size issue in terms of getting people from education all the way through. So um, we can do a lot better at getting younger people to study science, technology, maths and computer science. And that would have helped us uh, over the last 10 years. And why isn't that happening? Um, I think that's a combination of different factors. There's a, a bit of a stereotype of a, a, someone in computers as a... You know, a, a white male uh, geeky doesn't speak very well. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, maybe females or other people don't associate with that and didn't enrol. Um, there's a bit of a per uh, perpetuating cycle there. And so um, hopefully that's changing as people get more role models and as the government introduces more science and technology through the curriculum, um, hopefully that will change. Is there a need to change the national curriculum? I think there's a huge need to focus on science, technology, um, all the STEM subjects, um, particularly computer science, because if you look at how technology is changing the world in terms of computers replacing people, whether it's uh, replacing newspapers or whether it's uh, Uber, um, technology is sort of changing every part of uh, everyone's day-to-day day -day life and people need to understand that in, as they do high school. So I think there's a huge need for an emphasis on those subjects for us to be competitive in the 21st century. I know you've spoken before about maths and your dismay at the fact that people don't study it right through high school. Talk us through what your concern is there. Yeah, my concern is a, a few areas there. One is uh, gender is, is a big one and that uh, a lot of women, you know, stereotype that by the time they're in year 10 or year 12, they you know, don't want to study maths. Um, there's a phrase that I heard uh, on stage the other day that by year eight, it's too late. Um, and so you need to get women studying you know, science and technology, computers early on. And when they realise they're actually better at it than boys at an early age, they continue their studies. Uh, so I think there's a, a big need sort of early in uh, high school careers to get more women involved in science uh, subjects, um, as well as everyone else. I think that in the future, computers are going to really change the world and, and dominate industry. Well, how are we going to do that? How have, how have they done it in other parts of the world? Um, I don't know anywhere in the world that's, uh, uh, that's nailing this um, 100%. There's some areas that, uh, that I sort of look to for, for inspiration are uh, Vietnam. Vietnam uh, starts teaching computer science in year four and it's a compulsory subject all the way through high school. And so as a result, their entire populace is graduating, understanding computers. And uh, I just came from there last week. They've got an incredibly uh, burgeoning uh, technology industry there. So I think they're doing a, a good job. Um, I think things we need to do locally 
Um, I read uh, the government paper on uh, the national curriculum talking about technology and I mentioned teacher training seven times uh, in their recommendations. And so I think for us to teach you know, STEM subjects and computers, it really comes down to either training teachers uh, in the workforce or allowing those subjects to be taught outside the work, uh, you know, sorry, training teachers in the, in the school uh, yard um, or teaching those subjects outside of school because um, we do TAFE subjects for, you know, to do learn how to do building or mechanical uh, work, but we could do an equivalent thing for teaching code. I take a subject outside of school and that contributes to your high school certificate. It sounds like it's quite a tectonic shift that we need in the way we're, way we're educating young people. If Definitely. we're going to meet the opportunities that Malcolm Turnbull talks about for our future. Yes, I think that every job will be disrupted over the, the coming, uh, coming years. If you look at it, there's about a quarter of a million people uh, that uh, drive you know, as part of their job every day today. Um, and there's in, in addition to that, there's you know, about 12,000 train drivers. And when you look at things like self-driving cars, how many of those people are going to be displaced by self-driving cars? Um, and you know, maybe not in the next five years, but over time it will come to the stage where self-driving cars are safer than normal cars and people won't want to drive uh, anymore because it's, it will be seen as unsafe. That sounds at the moment a little bit bonkers, the idea of self-driving cars. Do you really see that as something that's going to take off in a commercial way? Definitely, definitely. Uh, at the moment, Google have driven about 1.1 million kilometres uh, accident-free in self-driving cars in California. And so that's the way of the future. People will have self-driving cars and it will be amazing uh, to think that instead of waiting for a bus, you know, a, a car will come and pick you up. Uh, and drive you uh, where you have to go. The amount of time that people sit on, you know, behind their steering wheel today, um, wasting those hours could be spent learning, could be spent doing their job, could be spent with family. Um, that all change sort of the face of uh, the way people spend their time. And if you think about the way cities are developed at the moment, uh, property prices are more expensive around train stations and around bus stops. Um, that'll change as self-driving cars come in. So I think it's a huge shift in how we live, work and play. Do you think that the big business community in Australia has adapted well to the digital economy? I don't think they've adapted well at all. Um, if we look at GST, I, I think that's going to save domestic retailers. Um, take Kogan, for example. He's been selling TVs online and doing a great job of it, disrupting Harvey Norman. And Kogan's an Australian-based company that pays GST. So I don't think GST is going to change the, the way that we buy online. Um, if you look at sort of the disruption, um, you know, you've got things like Fairfax, where they've sort of systematically lost every business that they had that made them lots of money. We now go to carsales.com.au to buy cars. We go seek for jobs. We go, um, you know, to realestate.com.au to buy property. Um, and Fairfax at, at uh, various stages had the options to buy almost all of those businesses and chose not to. So Well, and, they own them all in the, uh, the outmoded world of print. They did. They, they, yeah, that was part of their business. But even when they became, you know, separate companies, they missed the opportunity to buy them. Um, now, that's not too bad because those jobs remain in Australia, different shareholders in different companies, but, you know, it's Australia that's benefiting from that. I think the bigger disruption is in retail. Um, a lot of businesses, you know, live in, I guess, hope that Amazon will never come to these shores. And I think that's a terrible place to be because uh, Amazon will come and they'll have a better customer experience, lower prices, and a lot of the retailers in Australia will be disrupted. One of the areas uh, Malcolm Turnbull has said will distinguish him from his predecessor is recognising those jobs of the future. Does Australia's tech sector have the capacity to take over from the mining industry as our next big boom? That depends on a lot of factors. Um, you know, firstly, the size today. Like uh, when we started in, uh, 10 years ago, there were no other technology companies in Sydney, or very, very few. And now there are at least 10 companies that I know of worth more than $100 million uh, in Australia. And so we're already creating a technology industry. I think there's a possibility that with the right government help, with the right attraction of talent from overseas, um, with the creation of a sort of an epicentre in Sydney of technology talent, we can be a hub along with you know, Silicon Valley or New York or London to attract the best people. And if we do that, we have an opportunity. Malcolm Turnbull, of course, is a Sydney MP. Does he understand all of this? Have you had these conversations with him? I think Malcolm, more than any person I've met in the government, understands the challenges that we're facing. Uh, a few months ago, uh, Malcolm hosted a, a roundtable with about 30 or 40 technology entrepreneurs and was extremely uh, well versed in kind of the understanding of the problems we had, but also very interested in listening to, uh, to the challenges and the opportunities we have. So I, I very 
great confidence in uh, Malcolm's ability to, to tackle these challenges. Under Tony Abbott's leadership, was Australia heading in the right direction to take advantage of the opportunities of the digital economy? Did you get the feeling that he, as Prime Minister, understood the challenges and opportunities? I, in my opinion, no. I think Tony Abbott uh, has lived in a world and seen disruption, but maybe not at the pace that uh, I foresee is going to happen with technology. Um, and uh, so I just don't think he'd seen the disruption that that I think is going to happen in the future. And so the policies and other things weren't oriented around that. Had you had conversations specifically with him? Um, I've had some brief chats with, with Tony uh, about this. But you just didn't get the impression that he understood it to the extent that was required? Is that I think, saying? I mean, he was uh, passionate about maths and some basic sciences and uh, improving those things. But when it came to coding and computer science and technology, that wasn't at the top of his uh, agenda. Whereas you can see a distinct change, a distinct difference with... Our new Prime Minister? Yeah, both from before um, he was the Prime Minister and you can see in his initial speech, you know, he talked about the jobs for the future and technology and the impact that's going to have on Australia. So I think it says a lot when someone's first uh, speech after becoming the Prime Minister is to outline the technologies changing the world. I think that speaks a lot to, uh, to Malcolm. I'm very curious though to know what sort of policy parameters you're expecting to come. I mean, it's one thing to understand the challenges and the opportunities. It's another to follow through with policies that really kind of cement Australia's position in these fields. So, so what are you sort of expecting or what are you hoping for? There's a few things that I think that the government can do. Um, I talked about, you know, an epicentre for technology. That's really good. Um, there's a few things we do uh, well already, like research and development grants, which allow companies like ourselves to afford expensive people in Australia and keep our research and development here. So there's a few things we do quite well at the moment. Um, if I had my, uh, my wish list, it would really be around education and ensuring that the generations of, of tomorrow are learning computer science, are learning uh, how to do basic science, maths and engineering. That's my biggest wish. At the moment, uh, there's been education review after education review at the moment, and so I think it's really up to the governments now to act. Um, I'd love to see you know, computers on the education agenda in New South Wales, which is where we are, um, and I'd love to see that um, done through the allowance of uh, subjects to be done outside of school. I think that's the easiest way is to say, you can go to a third party and get credit points towards your high school certificate or your uh, school certificate. Um, if that still exists anymore. And, uh, and that can be done you know, online. Um, we have a, a great company called Mathletics, which is actually an Australian company, 3P Learning, and they train you know, children in maths. Um, but n to date, none of that learning can count towards the classroom. And I think that it doesn't make necessary sense to retrain tens of thousands of teachers, um, some of whom may be not particularly computer literate, to teach computers to, uh, to children. Is it urgent, would you say, that we get onto this? The sooner we start, the sooner we can, uh, we can have these students coming out of high school. And if we think we're behind Estonia, behind Vietnam, behind uh, looking at doing things in London and, and around you know, teaching children to code. And so every year we're, we're already five and ten years behind some of these countries. So I think it's urgent to the point that if we don't do this, we will fall further and further behind. And if you look at the future, um, you know, everyone consumes these days, you know, Airbnb, they book their houses on Uber. They uh, book their car rides on, they use Google and Apple, Facebook, and all those companies are headquartered in California. So all the profits are going to go there, all the jobs are going to go there, all the best people around the world are going to be attracted to work there. And so we can either choose to be a producer of technology or, or a consumer of technology. And I worry that if we don't invest in our you know, education system, we'll end up being a consumer. Scott Farquhar, we really, really appreciate the time you've taken to talk to us tonight. Thank you Thanks very so much. much.